She looked out from the window of the jet airliner and smiled with euphoric joy as she saw the surreal deep blue ocean stretching out for infinity in all directions. She felt that she had just awakened from sleep into a shining and bright world that outplayed any dream her unconscious might have conjured. Candace had landed the assignment of a lifetime, and it was taking her directly to one of the most beautiful and luxurious places the planet had to offer. In 2003, the Strange Facts website had been created by news legend Geraldine Freewall as a side project for the indulgence of her secret passion, tabloid journalism. At the time, no one had considered the net as a source of reliable journalistic insight, and so Geraldine had let her pocket news publishing house run rampant with every insane news story and rumor that roamed the World Wide Web. Astounded by its popularity, she would be even more shocked when her hobby became more lucrative and well-known than her actual print publication and televised news network. Within five years, she had been coerced by the opportunity to expand on the project and hired a small staff of editors and reporters to manage the site full-time. One of these reporters was a young journalism major fresh from an internship at the New York Times named Candace Beaumont. Over the following years, leading up to 2020, Candace would become her star reporter. So when she received a call directly from the chairman of the Yamashita Enterprises board requesting that strange facts run a story concerning its mysterious compound in the Fiji Islands, Candace got the job. Some 500 miles off of the coast of the known Fiji Islands, in the year 1826, a small barren island of dried rock and open lifeless grassland was discovered by Captain Jeremy Randolph of the Queen's Royal Navy. A landing party was assembled and Randolph quickly charted its location under the title of Carroll's Isle after his beloved wife. He and his men camped on the white sandy beach and set about making themselves a holiday in the guise of exploring the newfound land. What they would find during their investigations was a network of caves formed by the bubbling of ancient volcanic activity, and within these caves were the unmistakable signs of human habitation. However, all indications pointed to a great catastrophe and clear signs that the primitive culture had died out in genocidal warfare and cannibalism. Randolph, being familiar with the legends and stories concerning the other island cultures of the area, immediately declared the site as tainted and unholy. He and his crew left after only a week of studying the various chewed and charred remains of thousands of dead bodies. It would be another 20 years before anthropologist Jean Flameau would arrive to further shed light on the history of the Forgotten Island. It would be he who would determine that two separate colonies had taken residence on opposite sides of the volcanic island during a time when it was most likely as lush and tropical as its distant neighbors. His studies determined that the two groups had fallen into a long and bloody conflict in which both sides had systematically sabotaged and destroyed the opposing tribe with fire, war, and the eating of their enemy's flesh. It would seem that neither side would submit, nor in time, with the complete destruction of the island's resources at hand, neither group had the ability to leave. The tropical paradise had become a desert prison, and eventually the unending conflict would claim the lives of all. By the 1990s, Carol's Rock, as it had become known, would be purchased by the worldwide megacorporation of Yamashita Enterprises with the intent of restoring it to the grandeur of its past. With the beginning of the new millennia, Carol's Rock had been transformed into one of the most exclusive resort vacation destinations in the world. Also, it had become home to the massive Yamashita Genetics Research Facility known simply as Compound 5. The presence of the massive walled mini-city occupying the entire southern expanse of the island only added to the mystique of the locale as a tourist destination. It had become a common pastime of travelers to hike the long forest trails in hopes of seeing the bizarre products of Compound 5's infamous activities. 
the internet was filled with photos taken of birds and wildlife which seemed relative to various species which had been extinct for thousands of years. Experts balked at pictures of strange feathered lizards and small dog-like hoofed animals reminiscent of long dead species of equines as forgeries and doctored video. It was only in the summer of 2020 when one of the first disappearances occurred that the world began to truly question the nature of Yamashita's research on Carroll's Rock. Residents had begun vanishing in the warm coastal waters off of the populated beaches of the isolated Eden, and many wondered if Yamashita had not unleashed something altogether dangerous and ancient into the deep blue waters of the southern Pacific. Strange facts have been called to run a fully disclosed report concerning the actual goings-on within Compound 5. Candace would be given a full press pass and tour the facility along with interviews with some of the compound's leading scientists and researchers. Meanwhile, she would stay at a private Yamashita resort and the company would cover the bill. However, Geraldine Freewall had not become one of the biggest names in journalism by doing padded cover stories for major corporations. Candace was under the express orders to pursue all avenues and uncover any and all dirt she could find on the company and its relationship to the disappearances. After collecting her luggage and finding a Yamashita limousine waiting for her outside, Candace was taken across the island to her hotel. She snapped pictures from the window as she marveled at the sprawling tourist metropolis. She could never have imagined that so much money and ingenuity could be dumped into creating such a ridiculously high-end destination for the wealthy of the world. Besides beachside restaurants and vast streets resembling outdoor shopping malls, there was also theme parks complete with water slides and roller coasters. Live bands played on small stages at every other street corner as vendors sold expensive handcrafted trinkets from a virtual sea of booths and street side stands. To the south of this grandeur was a rising high country of tropical palms and green forest which traveled upward into the rocks of the dormant volcanic hillside. Behind this dense forest of waterfalls and freshwater streams hidden from view was what Gandis knew to be the endless electrified fence of Compound 5. At the hotel, the sun was setting over the distant ocean, and the sky had become a brilliant mosaic of reds and violet over the calm tranquility of the ocean. As her bags were taken, she entered the large open-air lobby, which combined the qualities of a dance club and restaurant bar, where music was playing enthusiastically over the babble and laughter of the stupor and relaxation of the patrons. As she was checking in, she noted bitterly that she had never seen so many rich and deliriously contented people collected together at once. As she studied the copious display of flesh and jewelry which dotted every square foot of the downstairs, she became aware that the girl behind the counter was speaking. Do you enjoy swimming or diving? The smiling dark woman said as she slid a mound of pamphlets across the marble top. Uh, yes, I think I'd like to try it while I'm here. She responded dazedly as a huge tanned man who rippled from every inch of his frame passed behind her clothed only in a beach towel wrapped around his fatless waist. This pamphlet has a number of our resident oceanic specialist, Helena. She is the diving instructor here, and she can help you with any activities you might wish to partake in. Thinking that she had three days until her first interview at the compound, Candace studied the pamphlet with curiosity. You have swimming with sharks? Isn't that dangerous? Oh, it's quite popular, and I assure you that it's very safe. Helena was a marine biologist before she came to us. She is the best in the business, as they say. Candace nodded and took the pamphlets with a smile as she followed a young blue-coated boy who took her suitcases effortlessly in hand to the elevator. Finding her excitement now diluting over the strain of her flight, Candace dragged her feet down the hall as she swiped her card and unlocked the door to her room. She nearly fell to her knees with wonder as she saw the room which had been bestowed upon her by Yamashita. The balcony extended over what would have been the outside wall of the room. No matter where she stood, lay, sat, or ate in the room, she could see the coast stretching out for miles in every direction. Her bath was a stonework hot tub large enough to house a pool party just off from the side of the kitchen, which looked to feed dozens. 
You can have a cook come and prepare your meals for you if you wish, the boy said as he placed her luggage by the enormous low canopy bed. She began to fumble in her purse for cash, but the boy smiled with embarrassment as, she w as he waved her away with a gesture. No, please, we do not accept tips. It is forbidden by the company, and we are very well paid. She looked up dazed and astonished as he flipped the switch and the room came alive with soft, warm light and music. I have turned on the room console for you, ma'am. It is voice operated, so all you must do is say, room, I want, and tell it your request. For example, if you wish to close off the balcony area, you would say, room, close off the balcony and it will close off the outside with a descending clear glass wall. If you have any questions, then say, room, explain, and then ask your question. We have never had any complaints, but should you have any trouble, simply call the desk. Candace thanked the young man as he exited, and then dropped herself onto the soft cloud-like mattress of the bed in ecstasy. Jesus Christ, she thought. I've died and gone to heaven as she pulled the pillow around her head and immediately fell asleep. She awakened the next morning to a calm and melodic female voice purring from some indistinct location of the room. She soon realized that it was the room. Candace, are you hungry? The voice said lightly. She sat up stiffly and looked to see a wondrous picturesque sunrise occurring past the open wall of the room. Uh, yeah, she answered awkwardly as she rubbed the sleep from her eyes. Would you like room service to bring you something already prepared? Or would you like a chef to cook for you while you wait? Room service sounds good, but can I get some scrambled eggs, toast with grape jelly, and some orange juice and milk? Of course. Would you also like an alcoholic beverage? Uh, no, it's a little early for me. Your breakfast will arrive in 15 minutes. Candace stood and laughed at herself as she realized she had not even removed her shoes in her desperate flight into unconsciousness. She pulled them off and headed for the bath as she reminded herself that the voice was only a computer and would not be watching her bathe. While she emerged from the hot massaging jets of the miracle that was her hot tub, she found her breakfast laid out over the oak to wooden table on the terrace overlooking the beach. She attacked the food and then leaned back in the cushioned chair as she stared out over the scenery. People were already flocking to the white sands of the beach in frenzied packs as boats and water skis began to dot the waters in long foamy trails. To her own disappointment, she realized that she had already completely lost her focus. She rose and went to her suitcase as she forced herself to remember that this was not a vacation and she was here to write a story. As she tossed her self-clothing into piles on the bed, she debated whether to wear her regular clothes or a bathing suit, since no one she had seen thus far, besides the hotel staff, seemed to require clothing. I'll stand out like a sore thumb if I wear jeans and a shirt, she whispered to herself as she removed her bikini and wrapped from the bottom of the case by her laptop. Crossing through the lobby downstairs, she glanced at the pamphlet in her hand and saw that it had directions down the beach to the location of the aquatic activity specialist, Helena McBride. She made her way out into the warm tropical sun and was immediately besieged by the feeling that she was falling under the spell of some narcotic which might have been slipped into her breakfast. Laughing, she realized that the only drugs which were influencing her were peace, excitement, and beauty. However, she noted that these influences could be more than enough to turn her brain into a lump of mush, should she allow it. Already, she had fought off the intrusive thought, I bet I can get a great tan, which had invaded her brain some twenty times since she had awakened. Helena, by Candace's evaluation, lived aboard the boat, which was also the staple outlet of her business. Although spacious and expansive, it was by no means the pleasure yacht Gandis had anticipated. The 60-foot charter boat sat docked across from a small building which seemed to be a hybrid storage unit and business office. Emblazoned in bold red letters across the side of the vessel was the words, Carol's Rock Conquest. Candace could see that people were already beginning to form a line outside the building. She sighed and was beginning to turn and retreat to some trinket shop when she heard a loud female voice call. 
Hey, you, you want to go diving? She looked over to the boat where a tall, lean woman dressed in a black skin-tight diving suit with the front unzipped to reveal a muscular but distinctly female chest was studying her from the rails. The woman's dark hair was cut down to stubble, giving her a sleek and androgynous appearance. Uh, I was thinking about it, but it seems like there's already a line. Not for you, sweetie, the woman laughed as she climbed down into the dock and approached with feline grace across the sand. You're the reporter. Uh, yes I am, she answered timidly as she caught a glimpse of the woman's intense brown eyes, which seemed to gleam like the moonlight off of the ocean's surface at night. I have orders to entertain you if you desire. The woman who Candace now knew to be Helena McGrubbeck Bride spoke with certain raspy warmth, which she found somewhat disconcerting. Company orders. We all get them. You are a top priority. I suggest you come out with me today and I'll make it worth your while. Candace tried to convince herself that the subtle innuendo of the diver's tone was her imagination. She brushed her long blonde hair away from her eyes as she looked at the boat with sudden enthusiasm. What would we do? She said, smiling like a giddy schoolgirl at a roller coaster. Everything and anything. Scuba, snorkeling, spearfishing, shark feeding, you name it and I provide it. Helena's lips were set with a cool soft grin which revealed perfect even white teeth. You know what I really want? What's that? Information? I've got that too. You can drill me for secrets while we snorkel off the reef. Candace wondered how they were going to talk if they were mostly underwater, but once more the uncanny bright euphoria of her surroundings was setting in. I'm coming down with vacation brain, she thought with some resignation. She nodded her consent, and Helena immediately approached the throng of tourists whom she dismissed amidst a murmur of moans and disappointments. As it turned out, she gathered very little information during the excursion. As soon as the boat left dock and hit the open water, Candace was struck with the awe of the sheer magnificent splendor of the warm Pacific day. All of her questions and her very reason were being on the island were wiped away by the overwhelming thrill of the speeding over the crystalline blue waters and later diving to the depths and seeing the exotic world beneath the surface. She found Helena to be as knowledgeable and confident as an instructor as she could have ever hoped for. Swimming in the clear embrace of the waters of the reef was an adventure like none she had ever experienced. It was as she was floating face down and examining the myriad of tropical fish below that she saw, for the first time, a wild shark. It was small and gray, darting like a missile through the blue expanse with effortlessness akin to magic in its grace. Startled, she whirled upright and glanced with anxiety at her guide, who swam a few feet away laughing. You saw it, didn't you? Don't be scared. Just stay calm and it will leave you alone. For the first time, she was abruptly pulled from the spell of natural beauty as she realized that she was but a speck of flesh floating in an endless blue limbo of predators. Later, as she climbed onto the wooden planks of the dock, she looked at her guide suspiciously. We spent half the day out there, Helena, and you haven't told me anything about the disappearances or Yamashita. If I didn't know better, I would think you were just distracting me. That's ridiculous, Helena replied from the deck as she stored away equipment. Look, how about I take you out to dinner, and you can ask me anything you want. The woman leaned against the railing casually, now dressed in a baggy blue camouflage print cargo pant and a tight sleeveless muscle shirt which revealed her strong veined covered arms. Okay, she agreed as she watched the woman descend the ladder with languid ease. Let's hit the strip and grab some grub. I'm starving. With her entire body now exhausted from hours of unaccustomed to swimming and diving, Candace was finding the walk back up the beach to be step by step a struggle on wobbly, limp legs. Her stomach rumbled as it seemed to be attempting to wrap itself around her spine in hunger. Where are we going? She said as Helena walked patiently beside her with little effort or weariness. Crab Shack. The tall woman answered as she pointed at a large outdoor canopy where only a few people sat huddled in the dim light of the burning torches. It takes forever for them to get the food prepared. Candace looked at her guide with obvious concern as she held her noisy abdomen. Then why are we going there? It gives you more time to drink, Helena said, smiling. As they seated themselves, Helena hastily ordered two crab platters and wine. 
Within moments, the waitress returned with an enormous bottle of dry red table wine and two glasses. Despite the protest of her better judgment, Candace began to attempt to satiate the sharp edge of her appetite with glass after glass of the fruity dark Cabernet Sauvignon. Now feeling intensely warm and relaxed, she looked up to see Helena gazing out over the ocean, her eyes filled with what she could only identify as an indefinable longing. All right, Candace began as she straightened in her chair and locked our eyes with the diver. Time for questions. Okay, the woman replied with mild amusement. I was told that you were a marine biologist. That would be correct. So why are you working as an aquatic activities director for this resort? Well, I grew up loving the ocean and I thought I wanted to study it, but it turns out I really just wanted to be in it as much as possible. I came to the conclusion about five years ago that it was pointless to try and understand something that I really just wanted to be a part of. It's kind of like Picasso said, if you love a woman, do you measure her limbs? I think that applies to everything really. So I loved the ocean and here I was trying to analyze it when what I really wanted was just to return to it. What do you mean? We all came from the sea, Candace. The whales and the dolphins just had no sense to go back. So, why here, doing this? It's pretty simple. I like to swim, drink, and eat. I want to be in the ocean all day and sit in cozy little restaurants, drinking wine and eating at night. Sometimes I sleep with a pretty girl and I am completely contented. Candace studied the woman with complete mystified jealousy. That's all you want? That's all. Just those things. I love the beauty of the ocean and the simplicity of its world. When I was a little girl, I used to want to be a mermaid, and this is about as close as I could get. And so you work for Yamashita. They provide me with the ability to live the way I want to live, and that is very important to me. And how much do you know about what goes on at Compound 5? Helena grew silent as she sipped her third glass of wine. I know that you don't want to mess with Yamashita, Candace. The woman's tone grew low and ominous. If they brought you here to write a story, then I suggest you write the story about what they want you to write. Candace studied Helena with a mixture of disbelief and intrigue. You make them sound like the Mafia, she laughed into her glass. The calm seriousness in Helena's eyes betrayed no hint of humor or deception. I'm not kidding. Yamashita practically runs the world, Candace. Half the population of this planet is owned by Yamashita, and they don't even know it. Okay, now you're beginning to sound like a conspiracy theorist. Am I now? Well, let's look at the facts then, shall we? Are you aware that over the past decade, Yamashita has bought out over 23 major corporations worldwide? That's not really uncommon in the business world. Major corporations, Candace. We're talking about standard corporate buyouts. Everything from Allwright Electric to your favorite retail superstore is now secretly owned by Yamashita Enterprises. There were no press releases, no layoffs, no real alterations that would draw the attention to their gradual takeover of the open market. You think of Yamashita and you think of some Japanese corporation, but what you don't understand is that even though Yamashita may have begun as some mid-level technological product supplier, they are now a global force to rival most world governments. And if you think the goal is something as simple as money, then you are sadly naive. Yamashita's business is advancement, Candace. Their business is to push the limits in every conceivable field of science, medicine, and technology. The stuff they're doing is unreal, Candace. Look around. I mean, this is one of the most expensive resort destinations in the world. And do you see any movie stars? Any politicians or rock stars strolling the beach? This island is a private resort for Yamashita staff and representatives, Candace. Every person you've seen living it up here on Carol's Rock since you arrived is in one way, shape, or form an associate 
of Yamashita. And then if you think I'm telling you this so that you can put it in your story, then you're truly not getting what I'm selling here, honey. You like that room you got up there in your hotel? That's just the beginning, Candace. You play their game and you might well find yourself living like this for the rest of your life. But if you decide to go all journalist on them, you may well wake up one day and find out that your life has been destroyed. I think you're just trying to scare me, Candace said barely above a whisper as her hand trembled slightly, making the wine ripple in the glass. I am. I like you, and I'm trying to make you understand what you're walking into before you make your trip to the other side of the island. Helena's eyes were cold and intimidating. Her gaze was broken only as the girl brought two platters of hot crab and placed them on the table with a smile. Helena thanked her and immediately began snapping through the shells as she hung hungrily began dipping the steaming pink meat into a bowl of melted butter. You should eat, she said as she stuffed her mouth full and chewed as if nothing she had said had been out of the ordinary. I think I lost my appetite. She abruptly stood from the table and was immediately beset by huge waves of dizziness and nausea as the alcohol, unhindered by any absorbent, rushed through her bloodstream. Helene attempted to hold her arm for support, but Candace pushed her away awkwardly as she walked away with the caution of a tightrope walker, looking to avoid plummeting from a great height. Come on, Candace. If you're not going to eat, then at least let me help you, Helena said, as she followed Candace onto the street after telling the waitress to bag their food. Candace only walked on silently as she glanced at the other woman with eyes now dark with distrust. Shaking her head, Helena turned and returned to the canopy as Candace headed for the large hotel. She realized that she had been foolish to trust a stranger, and now she felt that Helena had most likely been placed by Yamashita as a representative of their interests. She would not have thought that she would meet with such blunt and open manipulation. She knew that if she had been sober, she would in all likely would be a nervous wreck at the moment. However, under the cloud of wine, she felt excited and empowered. She was on the verge of a career-making story, and she refused to allow herself to become a puppet of the corporation. Now she was certain that they were hiding something, and curiosity was gnawing hungrily at her thoughts as she contemplated the disappearances. Finally, stumbling up into her room, she immediately found the coffee maker, and after placing a small sealed cup of French rose, watched as the device instantly produced delicious black coffee within her hotel mug. She sat down before her laptop and began searching the Carol's Rock News database for more information concerning the missing persons. True to what she had been told by Helena, each person had been a Yamashita employee currently working at the compound. They ranged from physicists to engineers and profession, but seemed unrelated personally. A senior researcher and his wife had been seen leaving the hotel early one morning only to never return, and this seemed to be the repeated pattern with all of the absentia people. The island police had searched the beach, hiking trails as boats combed the shoreline with no result. Rumors had run rampant, and Candace was amused to say that the local news on the Carroll's Rock was a flagrant with their theories as strange facts ever was. It had been suggested that a cult of cannibals were operating in secret amidst the bright spectacle of the resort community. But the more she read, the more convinced she was that such tales were being encouraged by Yamashita as a diversion. A blog from Great Britain read, Is Yamashita cloning extinct species? Following the paragraph was a series of photographs depicting unusual animals spotted along the forested border of the compound property. One in particular caught her interest as it seemed to capture what appeared to be an enormous woolly rhinoceros-like creature with a Y-shaped horn bathing in a clear tropical stream. The view of the photo was obstructed by underbrush and what appeared to be the wires of a chain-link fence. However, the image was very convincing. Candace knew that the fraudulent photography was the meat and drink of the tabloid industry, but she wondered if perhaps there wasn't something to the persistent, ongoing rumors. The coffee had sobered her only enough to make her feel ill, and after stumbling to the toilet to heave up a stomach full of mixed coffee and wine, she crumbled onto the bed and passed out. She dreamed that she was wandering alone through the jungle and came across a massive long-haired ape which was walking bipedal through the palms. At first she thought of the American Sasquatch, 
but after a moment remembered that Bigfoot was in fact supposed to be a descendant from a genus of giant ape which had once lived on the Asian continent. It's a Giganthropithecus, she thought with amazement. Yamashita has somehow cloned a long, extinct, giant bipedal ape. In the dream, the creature had detected her presence and turned in rage as it beat its chest, menacingly reminiscent of the display shown by aggressive male gorillas. She had begun to run in terror through the bushes as the thing pursued her like a bulldozer, crashing through the dense forest. She awakened to the sound of soft music playing in her room as dawn's light once more flooded the chamber. You were having a nightmare, the concerned voice of the room computer said. She sat up and looked around with wonder as her head began to throb with sharp pounding waves between her temples. Would you care for a doctor to visit? The voice inquired soothingly. No, she said awkwardly as she spoke to the strangely human disembodied voice. I just have a hangover. The doctor may be able to give you a mild painkiller to relieve the symptoms, the room replied happily. Really, it's okay, I'll be fine. She rose and dragged herself to the fridge, where she removed an ice-cold plastic bottle of water and began choking it greedily. Through the groggy haze of her thoughts, she began to assimilate a plan for her day. She needed to gather more information about Yamashita's work on the island without raising undue suspicion, and knowing that Helena, her most promising lead, was no longer an option, she felt an impending wall of inaction arising. She was now down to two days before her interview at Compound 5. The diving instructor's words had given her a completely new and paranoid outlook on her assignment. Any questions she asked might well be immediately reported back to the company, and staying in a hotel room where the computer monitored her closely enough to know if she were having bad dreams was not helping matters. Knowing that Yamashita had full access into every move she had made would be a shackle tied to her ankle as she tried to delve deeper into the mystery. She desperately wanted to see the compound and witness for herself if any of the media flooding the internet was real. Seeing one example of a resurrected extinct species could be the milestone in the creation of her report. If it were true, then it would mean that Yamashita, unbeknownst to the mainstream scientific world, had been delving into uncharted depths of genetic research. She decided as she polished off the last mouthful of her purified water that today she would be taking a hike into the hill country outside the resort. She realized painfully that as well as being in no condition to endure the tropical heat, she was also woefully out of shape. For a moment she contemplated asking Helena if she would accompany her, but winced as she thought of the previous night's conversation. Just as the thought crossed her mind, the room spoke. Miss Beaumont, you have a visitor outside your room. Would you like me to let them in? Who is it, she said as she whirly ran her hand through her tangled hair and wondered if a particular sudden patch was dried vomit. It's our aquatic activities manager, Helena McBride. Candace sighed as she answered, yes, go ahead and let her in. She watched as the door clicked and opened to reveal the tall woman standing in the hallway with a brown paper carry out bag wrapped in her arms. Hope I didn't wake you. She said with an endearingly shy smile. What do you want? Candace said suspiciously as a warm, delicious odor crept to her nostrils from the bag. I came to apologize, Helena said as she entered cautiously as if she weren't expecting an attack. I come bearing gifts. Her brown eyes were shining and bright as she held out the bag. What is it? Candace took the bag and peeked inside as the smell once more overpowered her senses and sent her stomach rumbling. French toast, sausage, and eggs from the downstairs restaurant. Candace's mouth was watering as she turned and walked for the balcony. Without another word, Helena, taking this as an acceptance, followed. She watched with reserved, dubious expression as Helena's angular face remained unexpressive and her manner polite. The tall, lean woman was placing the sealed containers on the table before raising a clear bottle of amber liquid from within the bag with a smile of conquest. Maple syrup, she said as she placed it carefully before Candace. Candace briefly considered with an envy how nice it must be to expend so many calories each day swimming that someone could eat as much as they pleased. I just don't get you. Candace said as she poured a slow stream of sweet, delicious smelling liquid onto the toast. I mean, you know I'm not going to sleep with you, right? Helena stopped chewing for a moment, as if considering her response carefully. Well, I do now, she said, laughing slightly to herself. Then what exactly is the point in all this? 
If you're trying to persuade me to alter my story in some way, then it's not going to work. Helena looked up and took a deep breath through her nose as she wiped her mouth with a napkin. I just don't want to see anything happen to you, Candace. You seem like a very good, honest person to me, and I don't see those qualities very often in people. Besides, whatever you choose to do, I am still obligated to help you. Okay, then. I want to take a tour of the island. Fine, I'll eat. Rent a car. No. I want to see the other side of the island. Helena looked down dejectedly as she used a wedge of toast to mop up the smear of syrup remaining on her plate. If that's what you want to do, then we'll do it. Good, Candace said with a certain amount of satisfaction. But I just want you to understand that you may be getting into way more than what you bargained for. Candace considered these words as she finished her breakfast and rose to prepare for the day in the hills. Helena had insisted that they rent a vehicle to take them to the best starting point for their hike on the other side of the island. After loading two backpacks full of water and rations, they drove to a scenic park area, which like everything else on Carol's Rock, seemed cut from a postcard. The trail which Helena had chosen for them would take them closest to the fenced acreage of the Compound 5. Of all the things that Candace had found in her research before beginning her journey, she had yet to uncover a single photograph of the facility itself. Now walking in the heavy, humid noonday heat through miles of endless tropical forest, she looked at her guide, now wearing a pair of shining, round, mirrored sunglasses, and wondered just how much of it at all she could trust her new acquaintance. You're looking for the mystery animals, aren't you? She pointed to a flock of brightly colored birds which were nesting together in a large palm ahead. Candace nodded as they scaled the steep incline of the trail and felt her digesting breakfast rolling uncomfortably in her stomach. Everyone comes out here hoping to see some weird freak of nature. But all that's right up by the compound. So they are real then, Candace said as she stumbled over a sharp gray rock. Uh, yeah, no bullshit there. I've seen them myself. But how is that even possible? How can you just let things like that run loose and hope no one sees them? Maybe you're just not seeing the big picture, Helena said cryptically. The trail seemed to be leading them a slow upward spiral, which dipped only occasionally over the certain small inclines in the grade of the hill. Kenneth noticed that the sky seemed darker over the tops of the tree line above them, and was sure that she had glanced at least one flash of lightning. Is it supposed to storm? she asked as she snapped a shot with her camera. No, but where we're going, it's always storming, Helena replied in the same mysterious tone. How is that possible? Candace adjusted the lens as she snapped several more shots of the darkening sky. If I were to venture, venture a guess, I would say it was an electromagnetic disturbance. Candace laughed. That's quite a guess. It's not really. If you had an EMF monitor, then you would might notice the readings would be off the chart. That wouldn't be that unusual for a facility like this. Just keep telling yourself that, Helena grinned sarcastically as they came to the top of the ridge and looked down into an enormous valley. The four of them lay across open acres of dense forest through which a 12-foot tall fence topped with spirals of razor wire ran in a circle surrounding a section of the cleared forest. Past this extended a cleared field where there appeared to be a small city of concrete labyrinths and uniform housing units which stretched out beneath the foreboding black clouds which whirled overhead. At the center of this grim, compact settlement was a huge series of structures whose design resembled a nuclear power plant or some such similar building, while to its side was a large steel tower topped with a bizarre dome. The air seemed charged with a buzzing static, which set every hair on Candace's body standing on end. She lifted her camera to begin taking pictures, but found that its console screen had become a blinking mess of numbers and flashing messages. What the hell? She said she began to try and reboot it with no success. Nothing electronic will work here, Helena said, as she pointed to her digital watch, which appeared to be suffering from some internal meltdown. So how exactly do you run a research facility without power? You don't, Helena said, without taking her gaze off of the imposing structure. Candace was just about to ask her what she meant when she noticed that somewhere within the entire compound were there any signs of movement of life. Compound 5, by all appearances, was completely and unequivocally abandoned. 
she just beginning to formulate a scathing line of questions when Helena began descending down the hill. She hurried after her guide and only caught up when the tall woman stopped near the base of what appeared to be the lightning blasted remains of a palm tree. Helena turned and looked over her shoulder smiling. There's something I bet you don't see every day. Candace looked at the small clearing where the diver was pointing and to her amazement saw a large bulky straw colored shape lumbering through the forest. At first she half expected to see the Sasquatch from her dream, but was even more taken aback when she realized that the creature resembled a painted reconstruction she had seen in a book from her high school science class of giant sloths from the Pleistocene. It had emerged from a large section of the fencing which had apparently leveled to the ground with its massive bulk. It was currently grasping at the branches of a tree in order to acquire sustenance from the leaves. See, the big one started tearing down the fence a few months ago, Helena said, as if it were some trivial annoyance which hardly concerned her. Helena, what is going on here? Candace said she once more checked her camera, with hands now shaking with excitement. The tall woman turned and looked at her, looked at her from the rim of her glasses. This is it, Candace. This is your interview, and it's ahead of schedule. Candace, speechless with wonder, suddenly felt a cold chill as she met Helena's stare. Now the question is, are you working with us or against us? The hard lump in Candace's throat would allow her no response. Just remember that if you are with us, we can make things very comfortable for you. But if you choose a more journalistic approach, things could be very unpleasant. I, I, I don't understand. Candace was sweating with fear as Helena began to stroll casually towards the fence. Of course you don't, my dear. I'm just wondering if I should even bother to explain. I'm making you an offer, Candace. I will bring you in on one of the greatest scientific catastrophes of the modern age. In return, you will help us to cover it up. You keep saying us and we. Who are you talking about? A strong wind was blowing out of the trees as the charged air seemed to glow heavy and impressive. Because I like you so much, I am going to take a chance on you, Candace. I'm going to tell you a few things, and then I will let you make a decision. Candace watched as Helena walked along the fence, raking her fingers over the wires as she seemed to be thinking deeply on her next words. I want you to imagine that there are two different worlds, two different realities, in which there both exists a company called Yamashita. In one world, this company is only your basic run-of-the-mill conglomerate looking to push past the boundaries of traditional industrial science. In the other world, it has managed to become a ruling entity which has seized control not only of the world market, but the United World Governments. In that world, Yamashita has become a corporate governing dictatorship who has subjugated every country and every person to its will. Now, just by chance, you have these two separate companies working on the same project simultaneously. Both had discovered that there were minor rifts on a subatomic level, which could be isolated and expanded by using a device resembling a particle accelerator. By harnessing a strange anomalous energy type, they both managed to create a large but unstable gateway between their realities. You can imagine their surprise when both realized that they had stumbled upon their own twin company working in tandem across time space. Now imagine that Yamashita team working in this world was extremely naive and immediately began an open-ended sharing of all their information with the foreign Yamashita entity. What they failed to realize was that the alternate Yamashita, Yamashita team was living in a utilitarian nightmare. I mean, you really cannot imagine, Candace, this place is like a vast worldwide labor camp on a scale that would blow your little mind. There are no beaches there, Candace. There are no resorts 
in water slides and in dance clubs. The very surface of the planet is covered in factories and industrial cities where people go years without even breathing fresh air, let alone swim in the oceans. The human race has become slaves to their own industrialization and all to further the rapid progress set up by a union of madmen obsessed with technological and scientific advancement. When the Yamashita team in that world opened that wormhole and saw your world, they could think of only one thing. How do we get there? 150 scientists, engineers, and technicians worked nonstop in the creation of a trans and dimensional Noah's Ark to get them through the vortex. They knew that the portal was ridiculously unstable, but at that point it didn't matter anymore. They had seen the paradise that awaited them on the other side. And if death were the result, then it would be better than remaining in the insanity to which they had been born. Long story short, it worked, but there were consequences. The wormhole became completely destabilized and began a random crisscrossing through time space. There were explosions and radiation breaches which lasted for months and all along the escapees from the alternate world just waited within their pod. By the time they finally emerged, there were very few of the original homeworld Yamashita technicians left alive. When they thought that the wormhole had finally collapsed, they arose from the vehicle. Now, these people weren't idiots, Candace. They knew that they had to work quickly to establish a cover for what had occurred. They immediately contacted the representatives of this new world's Yamashita and struck a deal which would be beneficial to both parties. In return for the sharing of their vast wealth of advanced knowledge, they would be allowed to stay on the island and live a life of unequaled luxury. Unfortunately, there would be a few snags in their plan. For one, the wormhole hadn't completely closed. It would, at irregular intervals, reopen and spew forth any number of things which it had acquired. As it raged through the fabric of time and space, the animals you see wandering here and there are just a taste of the horrors which are lurking inside that compound right now, Candace. If it weren't for an invisible energy field which the scientists erected at the border of the facility, this world would get a glimpse of terrors like it has never imagined. These Ice Age exiles, however, have become part of an unlikely cover story which has served us very well. What we need from you, dear girl, is to help in keeping that story going until we come to a clear conclusion on what should be done with the more dangerous elements lurking within. You see, I was head research manager of the team which crossed through the vortex all those years ago. You can have everything you ever wanted, Candace. You can have money, fame, a lifestyle like you never could have imagined in your wildest dreams. In time, we will be ready to destroy this entire island and make our way out into the world. You can help us do that, Candace. Will you do it? Candace stared down at the camera in her hands and then at the massive animal, which was crunching noisily, oblivious to their presence. Could she do it? Could she be a part of something so incredibly insane and monstrous as to aid these lunatics in their quest to live a life of permanent luxury, all the while dealing out technologies which could destroy the world? Can I think about it? Helena smiled and laughed. Sure, but don't take too much time. The clock is ticking away and this whole show sees its final curtain sooner than you think. Just a day or two, that's all I ask. That's fine. Enjoy the island. Just remember, Yamashita sees all Candace. Candace nodded and followed Helena as they began to make their way back up the path. Just one thing, Candace said, as they once more stood on the ridge overlooking the valley. You said most of the Yamashita team which worked on the project here died, but what about the rest? Well, most of them were quite happy to go along with our plans. However, 
There were some who were not quite so compromising. What happened to them? Let's just say they were given the option to resign. They said no more as they made their way back towards the resort. Candace knew fully well that she had discovered the truth as to what had happened to the missing persons on Carol's Rock. Walking through the lobby of the hotel, as she returned to her room, Candace felt the eyes of everyone present trained upon her. In each knowing nod and wink, she saw the hidden malice and calculating intellect she had seen in the eyes of Helena McBride. These people had no intention of ending their permanent vacation. They had all lived lives of controlled slavery and abuse at the hands of a corporation turned to monster. And there was nothing on earth which would separate them from their newfound freedom. Helena had offered her a choice. But this decision in itself was a lie. There was no choice here. Only the option to do as they asked would meet the same fate allotted to the survivors of the ill-fated research team. Candace laughed as a room, asked her if she desired soft music to ease her into slumber. You bitch, he thought as she wept. You've been working for them the whole time. soul to the devil, Candace drunkenly slurred from her booth table in the corner of the hotel bar. She laughed to herself dazedly as she picked through the pile of pills beside her, a bottle of tequila, and found a small white tablet, which she immediately chewed and washed down with another throat-scorching shot. She watched with mute interest as the hotel residents filed out through the lobby carrying their luggage and bags anxiously. Outside the wind was bending the palms into exquisite arches as the lightning flashed repeatedly over a rising chorus of thunder. Vacation's over, folks, she yelled as she toasted them. A few days ago, some hikers had noticed that the permanent storm over the compound had grown significantly and tests had shown that the containment field around the facility was nearing critical instability. A scouting party had been sent in speedboats around the other side of the island to gather intelligence from the shoreline and had witnessed the collapse of the southern wall of the main building into the ocean. By the time Helena had announced that the evacuation of the island was imminent, the storm had already escalated into a small hurricane as tremors began shaking Carol's rock to her very core. The first thought had been to load every available airliner in the airport for immediate liftoff. But the islanders had discovered that the electrical instruments had already begun malfunctioning. The last alternative had been to load the single luxury cruise ship ported in the bay. Kenneth had watched the bitter comedy as the Mary escaped prisoners of an alternate reality once more were forced to board a single vessel by which to escape. Come on, you lush, was Helena. She was grabbing Candace's arm and pulling her from the booth. But the journalist fought and struggled as she shoved handfuls of her pillow cocktail into her mouth and clumsily splashed the bottle onto her chin. Are you trying to kill yourself? Helena said as she pushed Candace through the crowd and into the storm. Candace stood in the falling rain and looked up at the flashing turbulent sky she held. Just trying to have a good time, hon. She raised her arms and whirled in a downpour like a schoolgirl enjoying a summer shower. That's what this island is all about, right? Having a good time and enjoying the lovely weather. I should leave you to die, you drunken slut, Helena hissed as she dragged Candace giggling and stumbling towards the dock. I should have just let you feed me to the sharks, Candace screamed, suddenly hysterical and furious. That's what you did to them, wasn't it, Helen? Take them out on your boat for a little recreational scuba diving and then dump some chum in water? What did you do, take them over by the shark reserve? Helena stopped midway down the dock and shaking the completely intoxicated reporter yelled, What if I did? It's not too late for you as well. We can make a little stop on our way to the mainland, Candace. Would you like to feed the sharks? You might as well. Candace said, weeping and falling to her knees on the wooden planks. I'm dead already, 
Everything that ever made me who I am is gone. My career is a joke, and I'm nothing but a shitty drug addict living on this shitty island with all you shitty people. She yelled this fiercely at the throngs of islanders as they hastened to the waiting cruise ship. Two large tan bouncers from the hotel group appeared as Helena ordered them to put the emotionally broken reporter on the ship. They dragged Candace sobbing up the ramp as the waters on the coast turned and swirled with increased dissension. As the boat left port, Helena stood on the deck at the railing watching as the black clouds seemed to swallow the twilight sky. She looked through a telescope and attached to her side and saw to her amazement that a swirling cyclone of black energy was whirling in the epicenter of the storm. She heard footsteps behind her and quickly she calmed her shaking hands as she turned to see Candace staring at her tranquilly, but with a measurable hatred. I see you're awake, Helena laughed as she put her hands into her pockets. You're looking a little frightened there, Helen, Candace sneered as she pushed her lank blonde hair from her face. Getting worried, are you? Worried? Why would I be worried? We knew the field was unstable. We thought maybe we had a little bit more time to get things in order, but we will contact Yamashita from Sydney. What about the vortex? Candace whispered as she took the telescope and stared at the storm with all. It will run its course and then it will begin to dissipate. You sure about that? I've been studying this thing for years, you simpleton, Helena growled as she snatched Candace's hair and pulled her back until the reporter's bloodshot eyes were wide and willing with tears. You've pushed me a little too far now. Helena ran her fingers along Candace's cheek, following the trail of the tear as it slid to her lips. You should have just kept your mouth shut and stayed happy, little whore. Helena reached up and began toying with the sterling silver hoop which hung from Candace's earlobe as her grip tightened and Candace's lips peeled back from her clenched teeth in pain. Now, sadly, you have become a liability. Candace screamed as Helena ripped the hoop loose and held it out over the railing, watching with fascination as the blood dripped down into the dark blue ocean waters. Candace struggled, but Helena quickly dropped the earring and snatching her arm, forced her face down onto the deck with a sudden abrupt clap crash which forced the air from Candace's chest. Helena drove her knee deep into the small of her back as she wrenched Candace's arm upwards until a low, cracking pop signaled the dislocation from her shoulder. You stupid suicidal little bitch! You think you're dead now? Just wait till you try to swim with that arm. Candace felt herself being lifted up by the strong diver's menacing grip and thrown across the rails as her feet left the deck and she was flung over the side. Her uninjured arm gripped the rail as she looked up to see Helena staring at her with cold, dark eyes. They're out there, you know, Helena pointed out over the water as she laid her hand gently over Candace's fingers, which shook and ached as she fought to clamber up onto the railing. The sharks? There's no telling how many, but they'll come for you. Hopefully, you'll just drown. There's always that chance, though, that there's a big bull, or maybe even a tiger, waiting out there for you right now. With the way you're bleeding from that ear, they'll have smelled it for miles. Helena began to delicately pry Candace's fingers one by one, until only she held her to the boat by the force of her own grip on Candace's wrist. I wouldn't bother holding my breath on the way down if I were you. Helena then released her hold and watched as Candace plummeted off the side of the boat and into the foamy waters by the side of the ship. From within the depths of her deep and almost impenetrable drug-induced slumber, Helena heard screams. Her mind was an empty bottomless abyss and the urge of her conscience to awaken was only a minuscule cry in the canyon of dark space. However, somewhere out there were the calls of horrified, dying people. Something was happening in the far-off waking world. In truth, she had no real desire to seek it out. 
but the drive of self-preservation demanded she claw and struggle to the edge of the darkness. And she woke. The lights in the room of her cabin were flashing erratically, only to finally fade to absolute darkness. She looked to her bedstand and saw the bottle of sleeping pills in the dimness of a sudden burst of lightning. Something had gone wrong. The storm was upon them. They were supposed to have left behind hours ago. But what time was it now? Nothing was working. She was laying in the darkness, contemplating whether she was even actually awake when the entire room shook as if the ship had been struck by something in the water. She rolled onto her feet and wavered with dizziness as she listened to the sound of crashes and pounding footsteps outside. Standing, she managed to only move a few feet before she slammed her shins across a wooden ottoman, laying hidden in the darkness. Closing her eyes, she conjured the image of the room as she had remembered it and slowly made her way to the chest of drawers where she withdrew her forty-five from beneath her shirt. Feeling her way along the wall, she felt for the hand sensor by the door. With no electricity, the security device proved a detriment as she contemplated how to open the lock. Resolving herself to desperation, she backed away and awaited the next flash of lightning to give her the light as she needed to aim and fire three times at the latch. Kicking at it eventually yielded results as she carefully stalked into the hallway and made her way towards the deck. The sky was a turbulent and violent maelstrom of whirling clouds and clear white cascading spider webs of electrical displays. The entire luxury liner was rocking unsteadily as enormous waves crashed against the sides and solid walls of destructive watery force. There were shapes moving everywhere, but she could discern no clear identities to the moving, frantic shadows. As she began to walk around the corner to the poolside, she nearly slipped in what she assumed was collected rainwater. But as the fantastic light show from above illuminated the night, she realized the entire deck was coated in streams of blood. The incredible amount of pills she had ingested was numbing her emotional reaction, and she found herself stooping to gaze at the still rivers of Burgundy with fascination. She noticed also that there were severed body parts and eviscerated torsos floating in the pool. Her dull mind was working in trying to formulate some answer as to what could possibly have occurred while she slept in her cabin. All seemed quiet for a moment as she looked up and surveyed the darkness around her. The shapes had ceased their movement and now the lightning revealed only a long, empty expanse of a deck in the distance. As she stood and held the pistol trembling in her hands, she perceived a pale shape moving on the rails at the far side of the boat. As her eyes began to focus, she beheld a ghostly white naked human form as it slithered onto the deck and began to crawl towards her slowly like a cadaverous human insect. As it drew near, she could see its face face was covered in its limp blonde hair. She felt the rocking of the ship and realized she could see the waves crashing in the night and she knew it was sinking. There were others in the darkness, pale shapes moving along the balcony and searching through hallways. As she gazed upon the creature's claw webbed hands and peeling fish eaten flesh, she knew it was Candace, even as it lifted its head and met her stare with its black, empty round eyes. Its mouth was a wide grimace of hunger, which stretched from one marred ear to the other with jagged, sharp, triangular teeth. They escaped, Helena thought as she raised the pistol and aimed at the creature that had been Candace's head. Soon, after they had left the escape pod, their lifeboat from the alternative world, the vortex had reached back into some ancient time, either of this world or some other, and brought forth a group of some long extinct species which had once dwelt in the ocean and around the island. The nature of these beings had been strange and incomprehensible to them, as they seemed part human, part shark, and completely hostile to their hosts. They had locked the creatures inside the compound and prayed that without the ocean water in which they lived to support them, they would perish. They had not, and now they were free. She had researched the history of the island and saw that long ago the people in the area had worshipped a shark god, which they saw as a guardian. She had come to the conclusion that the two groups of traveling islanders which had settled on Carol's Rock had not died out in some kind of civil conflict. 
but had instead been slowly eradicated by this lost race of shark creatures serving their ancient deity. The vortex had somehow brought them to the present day compound as some ironic cosmic joke. And now, somehow, Candace, the stupid drunken reporter, had joined them in her death. You can't have me, you bastards, Helena screamed as she began to raise the pistol to her head. It was then, in one swift blur of movement, the creature launched through the air and, grabbing Helena's arm, bit it savagely onto her hand and severed it to a bloody stump at the wrist. Helena screamed and stumbled backwards across the deck as she saw a horde of gray shapes moving all around her in the darkness as the blonde, undead creature gnawed and chewed at her torn appendage. In terror, she watched as they approached and found herself backed against the railing of the ship. She looked over the side and saw the waves crashing below and then at the throng of black-eyed predators approaching across the deck. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath as she threw herself over the edge. She slammed onto the water as if she had landed upon a hard stone, and then feeling the warm embrace of her beloved ocean, she sank into its depths. She did not fight or struggle to swim, but merely waited as she felt her lungs begin to ache and burn for oxygen. She hovered suspended in the dark water and opened her eyes to see the surface lit by the flashing of electrical storms below. It was then in the limbo of the ever-changing and moving miles of endless water, she saw it appear in an infinite shadow, weaving through the water like a languid, submerged island, approaching at a frightening and incredible speed. Its jaws opened and seemed capable of swallowing the entire world as she caught a glimpse of a single horrifying eye which was endlessly black with hunger and power before it filmed over into an ancient demon fury light. The darkness of this moving abyss enclosed her, and there was light and life no more in the realm of the shark god.